The internet controlling people's money. This is the issue today. It is messy. It is unfair. It is abusive. People are putting systems, I mean companies are putting systems ahead, self-authorizing themselves to do with people's money what they feel they can. And it's causing a lot of injustice and frankly it's causing thievery. I'm going to tell briefly why um, I'm worked up right now. To give the example, because what I want to talk about actually is... A solution, how to correct our existential problem as a human civilization. I always talk about uh, the relationship between the logical analytical mind in total disharmony and indifference to the thinking natural, always present mind that simply knows truth in the present and what is simply true without any kind of analysis or or logic, and then there's the mind that invents things and analyzes things, and there's a re an unstable relationship, basically, because the analytical logical mind is what's leading us in evolution, and therefore it's pushing for change, and anyways, I've done tons of videos about this. But what I never talk about is the, uh, the solution, the correction, or the answer to this self-afflicting, self-destructive um, predicament that human civilization is in. Now, the world doesn't work. It fails. It hurts us. Simple, empirical, this is not about judging human behavior or how people are or why they are the way they are. It's simply empirical and factual and functional. The world does not work. Why do we say this? Well, we poison ourselves, we, we destroy, we kill our own children in wars, we have injustice left and right, we get it wrong, we don't care, we just plow forward, we crawl, we, empires collapse, you know, and basically the world does not work for us. I mean, if you were, can, can you say the world works? The world doesn't work. It hurts us, it harms us, it poisons us, it kills us. Our invention, this civilization, this house of artifacts and services that we've designed is, has thorns aiming at our skin. It's, it, it's wrongly designed, it hurts us, it's not, it fails us. Now, I always explain in the in unstable relationship of the logical mind how it just doesn't care, it invents things because it wants to try something and it seems to work, and, and then it, it doesn't, it's not conscious that, uh, you know, the human body will only take so much of this before it starts uh, damaging, because it didn't create the human body, it's just preoccupied with putting to work and um, uh, odulating our, create, our inventions, our creations, and then everybody has to go along with that. And when we're talking about inventions, logical, analytical um, intellect of the human brain, we're talking about everything that we invent, all our services, all our philosophies, our institutions, our countries, our, our, our industries, our vehicles, our everything, everything that we come up with, from guns to money to everything that we invent and come up with, is a production of our logical analytical mind, which looks at the world and says, oh, well, how can we do this so that we, and we invent? And this is why we're so uh, apparently very, very brilliantly intelligent, precociously stupid, but we go ahead anyways with this amazing capacity. And then there is the mind that knows that's wrong. To see a child not eat because of this is not right. That, and, and the judging intelligence of the natural mind can determine that is not for us, it's hurting us, but it takes us forever and we, we're prone to just try to make it work anyways or look the other way. And so the world continues on and civilization continues on failing and harming us and hurting us and killing us. Is there a solution? Yeah, there is a solution. There is a way of something that we've never done before in light of this predicament we're in. First, I'm going to tell the story that made me 
get all worked up about this and want to do a video again after several months, I guess. Uh, I was just, there's a service called eDreams, right? It's like something when you try to buy a cheap ticket online, it gives you discounts and then it says, oh, you know, for only this little fee um, a year or a month or whatever, you also get all these discounts and, and, and plus you'll fly, you know, 30, 30 euros cheaper if you use us, right? Okay. So I bought this ticket and then I read that said, you're supposed to call in 15 days if you want to cancel the service. And then what they don't tell you is that you'll get charged that extra money for the airplane ticket that would have cost you without their service. Fine. Okay. Um, what happened was that when I got to Spain, uh, I was kind of in a bind and my friend decided to not gift me, loan me, uh, buy me a ticket to get back to Italy. Now, it might as well have been a gift for the purposes of this explanation. She got online and she purchased uh, with her credit card a ticket from Valencia back to Rome for me. It could have been a gift. It could have been a father buying her daughter, his daughter a ticket, right? Uh, and we agreed, I'll pay you back, you know. Uh, okay, so the thing is I had, when she put in my email, my, um, my eDreams account came up. And it got reactivated. Even though I, you know, I called and said, I, you know, I don't want this. When some automatic, like the guy on the phone I just argued for half an hour with, told me, the robot does it, he said. Yeah, you can't take the robot to court, can you? Um, activated my account. And so all of a sudden, when I called, she asked me, make sure that you call to cancel the promotion, you know, uh, account with eDreams because I don't want to get charged for a whole year of stuff I'm not going to do just because I bought you the ticket. I said, yeah, okay. So I, when I got to Rome, I called them and um, I don't remember what happened, but basically I got charged all this money uh, for the difference of the tickets that we just went, it just went berserk. All of a sudden she got charged, I got charged, everybody got charged. And the argument I had with the person on the phone just now was that what they do is they fudge the fine line. These promotions, these programs like eDreams and what have you, Establish, what they want to do is get you to spend money, right? They want you to buy their service so that you will spend more money with them, through them. So the core relationship is between the person that gives the money, pays with their credit card, and the service. When we retracted from the service, a yearly subscription, what happened was they went to charge my friend for that extra bit that the ticket back to Rome would have cost. And they, and what, and she inadvertently, I mean, innocently was afraid of some, or intuitively, whatever, withdrew all the money from her account so that no charges would have, would come surprise her. And what happened was that when E dream went to charge her more for the difference of that ticket that she bought without belonging to E dreams, they found the account empty and they turned around and said, well, it was for this guy who's the guy that traveled. She put my name on the ticket, right? And since he had an account, we have his account information, let's charge him. And so this is where the whole argument started. No, you can't do that. You have a relationship with a person who pays. If you didn't find money in her account, then you have a problem with that person who paid the ticket. You can't just decide, oh, let's see where we can go find the money. Well, we still have that guy's bank account number, even though he didn't, he unsubscribed, we can go charge him. And this is where the whole thing started. It's about ethics. Anyways, this is a small example of something that is probably happening in all over in huge ways with fees and stuff that people don't know. And they, anyways, what am I getting at? That our inventions, our systems, our mechanisms, the way we administrate and order things, or even the way we invent an artifact, which can be a gun, a car, a train, or 
um, any kind of chemical, you know, procedure to treat food or to, to build something. Everything that we come up with, by nature, because it is the logical analytical mind that invents the world, will tend to do us wrong, harm us, because it's... It has its own thing. It's going somewhere really fast, and it wants to get all these big ideas done um, for us. You know, the idea of uh, agriculture, for example, is so that not everybody has to sit down and plant their own little carrot and plant their own little potato, but that, you know, two people can take care of feeding the whole village. And so the intention is to serve its creator, mankind. But the way it's like kind of loses sight of who it's working for, and it starts making oh let's do it this way, let's do it that way, and before you know it, we're poisoning our water. We're no 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 because it's oblivious to how we were designed by evolution, by creation. It is not our designer, our logical analytical mind that invents prisons and invents governments and invents. Uh, uh, you know, uh, how to pull oil out of the earth, is not who designed our sensibilities and our nature, our limitations, our primitive primordial reactions, our, when we lose our patience, when we get excited, and, and what really we're after, what we need, what really fulfills our, our soul and our existential perception of life uh, kept healthy and so forth. It, it's not... In tune with that, it just goes. And so as a result, because it has its own random crazy mind that is thinking for a few minutes how to do something good for us and then it does it all its own way and ends up hurting us, killing our babies in wars and poisoning our water and so forth, there is this imbalance, this perpetual state of imbalance of, uh, that defines human, ex the human existential condition, our civilization. This is why we... Uh, now, I can start talking at this point about how we addressed that and what explanation that became theological we created and we wrote to sort of give us some peace with this self-affliction that seems to happen in our existence. But that's not what I want to talk about. I want to talk about how to understand this existential condition, this human condition, in order to propose a way of solving the problem, of dealing with uh, how to make civilization better, in other words. Let's jump to an analogy. The analogy of making a movie. Let's say making a movie is life. Now, in making a movie, we have the writer, the director, and the producer. If the director is the one that says, oh, well, we're going to wait, make windmills that use, you know, cyanide for paint, you know, and we're, but it's going to produce all this energy, and this is how we're going to do it, is the director. The producer is the one that says, well, I got the stuff, I got the money, you know, we, this is where you can get the funding, this is where you can get all that cyanide, this is, uh, you know, these are my, the people who I, I, I'm interested in benefiting, you know, through your construction of this windmill. And the writer... The writer is basically the people. The, our ideas of what we want the world to be, what we imagine, and part of that imagination, that imagination of how we imagine, how we write our world, is a combination of our inventions and ideas and this precocious, self-afflicting, uh, analytical intelligence, and also what we know is true and real and necessary. You know, that we all eat every day, for example, or that, um, you know, that we learn well the things that we're capable of teaching and learning for a better civilization. So we know that study is a good thing and that we need to either form our kids in, in, in dad's uh, wood shop or we have to send them to school. But we know that. So there are things that are just eternally true. Education is one of them. How we educate how we will create that education, well then, that's where the logic on, oh, let's invent universities, you know, where before, in more primitive times, we're much closer to the natural mind, and we simply intuitively did what dad did at home, and we, little boys learned to do the same, little girls maybe also, or learned to do what the mom did. 
producer, writer, director. So we see the imbalance. We see a movie is basically the failure of civilization. We have this idea of what we want the world to be like, and then the producer says, I know how to, this is how we're gonna, I'm going to put the pasta in and the force to do it. And the director says, this is what I think we can, you know, how it should be. This is, these are the details, and this is how we're, we'll design it. Now, who's, where is the real person? Because the writer is just our ideas of what we want of the world. But who is the one that actually designed Design the body. Let's go to another example. Let's imagine that we're driving a very sophisticated car, like a Maserati or something. And so you have the person that's like, oh, I know what to do with this baby. You know, I'm going to floor it and take the curve this way and that way. Then there is the person perhaps sitting next to the driver who happens to be the one who designed the car. The person that designed the car and, and measured how big every bolt was going to be and how much gas was going to be consumed by the carburetor is sitting next to the driver and knows, simply knows, everything about how the car is going to perform and why, what its limitations are, what it can do and at to, up to what point it can do that and what it will never really want to do, the designer of the car. will say to the driver, right, okay, at 95, slow down. Because if you every day drive at 95 for more than an hour, what will happen is that this will start getting wore up, worn down. Uh, you'll end up having to replace that all the time, right? Wouldn't it be great if we all had somehow this genius of the physiological human body and its natural natural gen, uh, mind and how we are well we don't have that we don't have that and the world is out of control so what we're proposing is that we have a fourth element of authority we have the writer you know, he says, oh, how about if we do this with the world? You know, how about if we all have like flying cars? You know, can you imagine zipping around? Oh, wow, what a great movie. Okay, I can see that world. It sounds crazy, but okay, let's write that. Um, then the producer, right, is maybe the one that pulls the, the industries to do stuff. And, and the director says, this is how we're going to work it. We're going to get the financing from here. No, no, no. What we're saying is, let's introduce a fourth element. Somebody that says, what is this going to do to the human being? How will the human being act, perform? How will he be affected? How everything will react and, and, uh, and desire and, and be not good at or be shy of or, or, or be not so sure of or will try to... Um, naively and stupidly want to go for because I know the human being so well that I, I know how all of a sudden we have the fourth element the designer of the the ones that will act in this story in this uh, story created by the writer it's like okay so you want to have uh, I don't know you want to have a story where there are these flying cars and there are these families and da 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 that they live in these communes and whatever. And then there's a story about the struggle between the villages and what have you. No, no, no. Okay. But you know, says the fourth element, that actually would never happen because people will try to reconcile anyways behind the backs of those that are trying to create the war. They really, deep, deep down inside, they don't want to see destruction. So there will you will have a... a an appearance of people who will try to sabotage the idea of creating that war. Now, in the writer's story, you have a, just this big population of people that says, okay, all right, um, this is what they're doing, this is what our governor, our 
leaders are doing, taking us to war, and they don't. The villagers are just going along with a story plot of of the writer. But the fourth element would say, no, this is actually what would happen. We don't have that in civilization. We don't have, for example, now you could take the fourth element of of authority and create any number of examples because the world today is pretty much built this way. You have, for example, a restaurant. You have the concept of, of how, uh, what will sell and what will be attractive and um, th who is the writer, you know, the, the, the idea, the concept for the restaurant. And then the producer is kind of like maybe the owner as well, the, the, the same as the writer perhaps, who says, well, you know, I got this money and I have this idea. So you have the producer and the writer. And then the director will be maybe the manager or the person who's a professional who's worked, uh, who's made a bunch of restaurants successful and will say, okay, this is, you know, the prices and the menus have to, nah, 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 nah. and then you have the, the, the people that will either go eat there or not go eat there. The people that will stay in a country or, or will start looking at other countries to go move to. The fourth element would be the person says, you know, uh, in reality, I know the beat. I know what's happening in the minds of our entire society in our country. And for example, uh, you might want to eradicate these preservatives or you might want to introduce uh, something that is completely novel to the writer to the concept creator or the producer of the restaurant, the builder of the restaurant, because they know how people are. And they, he, that fourth element will come with ideas that are completely about simply knowing people and knowing uh, that people want to see children be able to go to restaurants with their families, but they don't really want to see kids, um, you know, act up and climb over the tables of <laughs> next to them and bother other people who are eating and shouting and screaming. Yet we all kind of do want to see places where you can take your children, perhaps. This knowledge is kind of worked somehow. We try to um, f fill in for what would be the fourth element. And we have solutions to situations that are either people who want to have kids and then all of a sudden they have a little playground inside the restaurant or people that say, no, 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 this idea prevails and so you can't have kids in this restaurant. But in, the truth is a single one. There's a single truth for the human being, which is we all... And of course, when we talk about the fourth element, we're also talking about the single truth that is the human being. Now, a lot of people go, ah, how can you say that? That's tyrannical. You know, we're all different. And who, what is the truth? And well, you could say what is the truth if you have a, a, a spread of different possibilities. And so why should that be the truth when also this is sought or this can happen? But you could also talk about the single truth that is for real, which is how we simply are or how something, something simply is, for example. If you say um, a sunflower is yellow, you know, the, God knows they've been trying recently to say, well, what is yellow? <laughs> you know, uh, no, it is yellow. There is a color that is yellow and the sunflower is yellow. This is the single truth of the sunflower. Now, there may be sunflowers that have different colors, or you could say yellow is a happy color or a sad color, which is different, because we're not talking about interpretation or human behavior. We're talking about how we're designed functionally, empirically. There is a design to the human physiology. There is a singular design to the human being. We seem to be wanting to fight it lately, uh, and for reasons that I'm not going to get into right now. But we can talk about a we are. It exists. It really does exist. There are two genders, for example. This is the easy one because sex and, you know, genders. And it's like anybody can talk about this. It's like the layman's uh, critical logic, right? 
There are two now. Ideologies, conceptual ideologies, philosophies about how to interpret have come up with a lot of recent stuff, as we all know. But basically, it all comes down to the undeniable singular truth of the human design, that is, that we are two genders. What we didn't build properly is what can happen to those two genders. We, for example, any one of us could develop and for whatever, for complex, somewhat complex reasons, uh, prefer a life of homosexuality. But it's not that some people are born gay and some people are not. That's a big mistake. That's an error that we made propulsed by, the, by imposing ideologies that forged us to want to redefine the understanding of the human design, of the physiological design. Now, we can... There is one human sexuality, the sexuality of human beings, and it just so happens that as nature and evolution obviously made it for us to procreate, it works a certain way, which is still the singular truth, but also the singular truth is that in all these circumstances and environment conditions or whatever development and influences by society and parents and messages that the people the kids start listening to or the way they were treated or not, if a certain tendency can more strongly start developing this way, another tendency may not be so affected by these same conditions, but a a seeking of homosexuality can happen, can develop in any one of us because it's about human sexuality. It doesn't separate people. Homosexuality or sexuality doesn't classify, doesn't separate the human being. We all have this sexuality that can develop homosexuality uh, and it, it wouldn't, it's not that it would develop for somebody, it would never develop for somebody else. No, it's human sexuality. So, already we have a hard time uh, being able to come, uh, um, how do you say this, um, with confidence, confidently use we in the singular truths of the human design because of the mess that we have made with ideological, uh, philosophical thinking, uh, telling us how we should think and how we should view things. And creating situations of, well, this is a whole, it goes, why did we polarize? Why, did, why do we tend to separate and seek right and wrong? And that's a whole other, uh, it kind of goes back to the, the same origin that I was just talking about a minute ago. But the point is, we need to seize this um, devastating, you could say, uh, 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 unbalance and disharmony that exists, this lack of, a bonded lack of relationship. In other words, we can't separate the, the logical, uh, analytical mind, the inventive mind, let's call it, from the natural, truthful mind that knows this is simply always going to be true. Water will quench my thirst. Now, I could say, well, you know, quench it with Coca-Cola, quench it, and yeah, it kind of works, oh, my thirst is gone, okay. But... Is it doing the same thing that water is supposed to do to the human body? Part of it is, and then it also comes with this other stuff that gets deposited in your... And so, the human, the logical analytical mind is kind of crazily doing its own thing, trying to serve the human body, but ultimately there is a mind that knows the ultimate greatest truth that is always true. And... There is no, um, there is no, how can I say this? No, um, there is no coherent, no uh, understandable, uh, no comprehensible logical relationship between these two minds. It's like, I'm just going to, uh, I'm just going to evolve. I'm just going to push the other way and I'm going to take my wife and my kids and go start a new language in a new village somewhere else and screw you. I don't care what happens to you all. And then, you know, later we're like, oh, but we come from those people that we left 20 years ago in the other valley. And why does that happen? Because ultimately you can't separate. There's a force that will always seek um a stronger, uh, the, the, the unifying force of the species, we're alone in this world and we're all one species. 
and and really there is no like a subspecies or anything we are and so we're still pulled to want to to need the other to collectively and it has to do with evolution because evolution does not uh uh design a, a pilot sample and then copy it no it always exists creating plural plurally collectively as it evolves new species or, or new subspecies it's always a collective thing so if you want to understand through sciences of ideology even the, the the human mind the human being even politically you must start on the collective need to be a collective before you stand on individualism it human the human humanity doesn't start on individualism and and from there you create a a political philosophy and everything else that gets explained about civil uh, ideology and civil law and everything starts from in no you are you are condemning yourself to encountering errors if you don't start by understanding what the species will always want to come back to which is you know are those people okay or I hope they don't forget me and I won't forget them even though now we speak different languages and we live on the other part of the world we we will always forever know that we are the same and that's where political um civil and civil ideology ought to start is within the collective yes there is each individual and the collective perhaps exists so that each individual can exist freely and uniquely because within each individual is this expression of the logical crazy inventive mind that will come out and come up with something that is great and self-destructive and so and want to lead through the individual uh often that's why you have inventors sometimes locked up in their basements getting all crazy and coming up with something brilliant but then what do they do they come out to the surface and say this will serve humanity this look at this and and he's like trying it on people see if it see if it works so even in such detachment it individualism really is going back to the collective and 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 to one another and that's why we will always seek the ex- matter so much to us or seek the acceptance of the collective and it does this imbalance which has defined this this harmony and this chaotic kind of rolling forward of civilization in in disarray and then coming back up and trying it again and it has been human civilization killing our babies poisoning ourselves poisoning ourselves having buildings collapse on our heads and then we just continue rolling forward with this civilization that we create has never had a voice that says okay what about us will this building fall on our heads let's check and make sure that it won't <laughs> cuz if we had had that fourth element that says you know we are vulnerable we won't run out of here in time and our logical analytical intelligence is precocious and 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 just uh, how you say this um impetus imp- imp- impetuous and will insist on uh, because it's so sure of itself and uh we know this about the human brain so let's protect ourselves from our own logical intelligence and make sure this building doesn't fall and look at everything that we invent to see how it's going to treat and uh influence or affect the human the human invention the human creation the human physiology that professional that creator of the lamborghini or what did i say maserati has never existed but we can create it we can come up with that we can come up with we know how the we actually do know we already know actually uh things that would start versing that per those people we've never created them and obviously because the idea of them having authority is like a a utopian kind of concept but creating the fourth element would be a way of us saying okay wait we are aware that we will end up hurting ourselves with our own proposals and inventions 
So, since we know that our tendency, the tendency of the logical and analytical mind is to betray or not care if it's hurting or just plow forward and maybe please a few things enough to that people go along with it and it's all out of control because then they went along with it and they started drinking the poison and the Kool-Aid and, and accepting and then started coming up with explanations, you know, that it's... The building fell not because the cement was weak, but because there was corruption in the construction industry. And so we explain things differently, and we never have had the voice that says, no, we weren't thinking <laughs> that our precocious mind made a cement that won't last. Uh, and that, um, you know, or that asbestos would eventually degrade. And that seeking uh, of, of that much higher intelligence would only be possible because there was uh, a mind, an intelligence saying, okay, what does the body need to breathe? You know, what does, uh, what should the air be composed of so that we're always optimally healthy? What should we not eat and what should we eat? And all these sciences kind of exist in disarray is what I'm trying to say. But we haven't really said, okay, let's do the, make the world for the human being. Not for the interests of the logical and analytical mind, so that money can plow forward and do what it wants with people. Not so that we can live like, uh, you know, like, like monkeys eating apples out of the trees and just sleeping on the ground, because maybe that's what the pure... <laughs> Uh, natural mind would say, okay, that will never fail, you know. We also are our desire to evolve, and um, yeah, anyways, I, I think I got the concept through, um, and it would be, you know, the way to start saying, you would, it would have to have authority, it would have to rise and say, okay, stop, you know, Washington, what, are you crazy? That will end up causing a war, killing people here and there. What people? You know, you think you're, uh, you think you're leading your government. You're not. You know, it would start seeing what the how the world is actually working and start talking to ourselves and saying, "Look at your inventions are not really serving you. They're not doing. Uh, they're not keeping you healthy. They're keeping you living on the streets. They're keeping you. Uh, so that." voice that human being that actually cares for itself and has authority over everything that would hurt it and uh, and would authority that would make sure it gets what it needs you know and the way nature says it it should need it because for example let's take water Right now, okay, w the natural world, before we created this huge civilization, we would go to the stream and drink fresh water. And we evolved 99% of our evolution drinking wa clean water from streams, right? And so that is our highest truth. That is what, when we're thirsty, we should go and be able to cup some fresh water. And that is the greatest, the truest, the best the optimal truth for us. As we invented civilization, we started, you know, uh, channeling water and bottling it and putting it in. But we always kind of knew this. We always knew that water should be freely accessible immediately when you need it to wash, to drink. But as our logical mind continued building and making more complicated and more willfully its own idea of what civilization should be wouldn't you know we're a, we're like all of a sudden we we don't even know where a stream is we can't even find clean water we have to pay for it in bottles or we if we don't pay for it in our faucets it's it's uh you know they shut it down and all of a sudden we're, ugh, we're dying of thirst and what are we doing to ourselves this is not how we were designed by evolution we were designed to have water or food be able to uh make our own shelter and protect ourselves from the cold and you know these are the things that have been with us and with our intelligence for 99 percent of our evolution now all of a sudden our logical brain wants to say oh you know we're just going to design the world with through these ways and these systems and this is how we're going to run things and 
all of a sudden look at how we're living, you know, we're, we, we don't have water at home, we kill our babies in wars, we, we drink poison in our, in our beverages, and, we, you know, it's crazy. People are sleeping on the streets, and they can't sleep freely in a park because they'll get kicked out, and, and, and they just don't, people, this new administration of aesthetics doesn't want to see broken down people because it can't, uh, it can't feel proud of its logical and analytical civilization, or can it, when it sees people that are, have fallen through the wayside, through the gutter, I don't want to call it through, yeah. So we're just making it worse and worse and worse and worse, and we're inventing perversion over perversion over perversion because nobody stands up and, say, and says, there is no human being, no fourth element to say, stop, stop. Everybody needs to have a place to sleep eight hours every day comfortably, safely, uh, you know, protected from the elements. Everybody, everybody should have, you know, access to pure, healthy. And what are the natural rights? Let's talk about the natural rights that we are all born with. Our, our right to associate with um, whoever we want to, be friends at any time. Nobody can say, don't talk to that person. We have the right to talk with whoever we want, as much as we want, wherever it happens. We have the right to uh, drink and clean beverages and healthy food, and we have the right to uh, find a shelter. I'm not saying the government build me a house. I'm saying we should be able to, okay, find it. Go somewhere where we can get under a roof and get comfortable and sleep. Not be banned from having it not be barred from accessing stuff that we evolved with 99% of our evolutionary trajectory. Um, and so this is what human civilization has never had. We have never had, it's sort of like saying our own God, our own creator. I'm like saying, I, I, you know, this is, I'm protecting this, this creature, this wonderful, intelligent human being needs, at the very least, the, these conditions as a right of existence. It needs to have these uh, minimal, optimal conditions for it to be at least its basic best, you know? Uh, there is no fourth element uh, standing in with the other authorities at B that says, no, yeah, okay, great idea, but no, that's going to end up hurting us. And, you know, or says, yeah, okay, I see how uh, that will be great for everybody, but is it going to be for everybody, or is it just going to be for the area that you have power over? You know, nobody is looking for the one singular collective human being either. We try... This is what I'm saying. It's not like it's all scattered around. It's never been condensed. But somehow we know we created the United Nations. So we have the idea that somehow we need to achieve reunification. But we're not doing it for us because we know the human physiology and the physiology of the collective. We're imposing ways of administrating, of enforcing through uh, governance and ideologies how people should behave. And we're just not doing it because we know how we are and what we need. We're doing it because of how we think we should tell people to do it, uh, which is all an ideology is. An ideology is an idea that this should be good and then you should do this. But it's not because I know. <laughs> it's not because we know that's really what the design of the species will thrive with, for sure, as if we were the creator of it, it's because we have had these ideas that stand on other ideas, that stand on other ideas, and, and so then we start believing that these things that we prescribe ought to be respected and implemented and, 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 and used in the construction of governance or civil law or what have you, but is it because we know what will keep the collective healthy? This... You know, we can do it with animals, can't we? We can do it with plants. We can say, okay, so this field will always have beautiful, strong flowers, 
we know what to do. We know what to do so that animals uh, don't catch diseases and they all have enough space and stay healthy and thrive. But we can't do it for ourselves. We don't know how to take care of ourselves because we've never had really a strong we. We are. We are the human, the human being, the human collective as a conscious, um, intelligent discourse. It's just never existed. We've never talked about it. And we, we do start a little bit. We soon run into uh, these people say we should think this and that. Pe those people say that it's not like that. and blah, 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 It falls apart. We never get too far with it. And yet we need to. <laughs> we need to build it all the way. Build something that says uh, this is how evolution made us so that the collective species is optimally thriving and healthy as a whole. And that become an authority, which would be the fourth element I call it. The fourth element, the green, I call also the green um, profession, <laughs> you know, the green study or the ecological, the organic humanism, you know. I don't know, but it, the idea, the concept is very precise. And I hope I transmitted it well enough for you all to understand this time. Bye.